Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the joint OpenStack Kubernetes environment. I think I gave it a more hybrid y, cool sounding title. Um, my name is Rob Hirschfeld, uh, and we're going to spend about 40 minutes talking about OpenStack's favorite topic, which is Kubernetes. Um, and we're going to go through this is uh, supposed to be an operational, very pragmatic assessment of um, this joint OpenStack Kubernetes environment. Uh, this is something that uh, six months ago, a year ago, I was, I was very skeptical of. Um, and so I've been giving this presentation in a series of progressive updates. Uh, so this is our, our May update. Uh, the short version, if you want to catch another session, is yes, uh, we can put, this is a Kubernetes under OpenStack talk. Um, and then Kubernetes becomes the dominant platform. And we'll talk about all that. That's my short summary. You're, that's it. Uh, my name is Rob Hirschfeld. I've been in the OpenStack community for quite some time. I was a board member for four years. I'm currently the co-chair of the Kubernetes Cluster Ops SIG. So if you're an OpenStack veteran and you remember the days before we organized operators, we're trying to avoid that mistake in Kubernetes. Um, and I'm also the founder of some open source projects. One is called Digital Rebar. If you're an OpenStack veteran, you'll remember a project called Crowbar, which is still SUSE's installer. Um, I was a founder of that project also. Um, my company, Rack N, specializes in hybrid automation. So we work on underlay, uh, so physical hybrid cloud type of deployments using Chef, Ansible, Puppet, Salt, whatever. We do, we do a lot of that. Um, in the past, I was at Dell, um, and I've been doing data center operations work since 1999. So the, the framework for this talk, and we will get to some very detailed components of how this works and, and how it goes, but it's important to me to frame it so that you understand that we're talking about operational needs. Right? This is not a Kubernetes dev talk. It's really about how do we help operations succeed running OpenStack. And operators are not developers. They have different needs. They want things to be very simple. They want them to be transparent. They don't want to be hacking the code base of the platform they are trying to get running. They want it to run. Um, and one of the things that's important with this is that we don't want people, to, our operators, to be asked to become super users of the platforms that they're trying to deploy while they're learning how to deploy them. So that means you don't try to make a Kubernetes operator learn Kubernetes, right? Not initially. OpenStack users shouldn't have to, operators shouldn't have to learn OpenStack initially to run it. Right. My experience is that running the platform is very different than using the platform. They have different, they're actually designed to have different abstractions between what you use, which you're trying to hide, and what you actually have to deal with to make that platform run. Right. So when you're dealing with an infrastructure platform like OpenStack or Kubernetes on Metal, you have to deal with RAID and BIOS and drives and networks and a whole bunch of messy stuff. Once that, stu that, that platform is installed, your users should never see that. The whole purpose of those platforms is to obfuscate the mess of infrastructure. Um, and then the number one thing that we learned early in the OpenStack days, and I think is important in, in any platform, is upgradability is a number one operational concern. Right? Operators, unlike developers, don't keep installing the platform on a daily or hourly basis as they test it and change it. Right. We, want to ex we want that platform to be upgradable so that as we find bugs or patches or something comes out, we can fix it, saying, oh, just tear down your Kubernetes control plane or your OpenStack control plane so I can put in a patch is not an acceptable answer. Right. So in general, Kubernetes has very good semantics and operational foundations for this type of infrastructure pattern. It's actually very well designed to be upgradable, to be replaceable, to be easier to understand. Um, and it, it's actually a robust infrastructure designed for people to do HA upgradable deployments that have a, a degree of self-maintaining. Um, and so that's one important thing about this. And then there's a second piece that to me is evolving out of the Kubernetes under OpenStack story, which is shared operational best practice. So one of the things that's been missing in the OpenStack community, um, somewhat on purpose and somewhat by accident, is shared operational vision. If you go to the, op the ops meetups, you'll find that every scale operator has their own Puppet, Chef, Ansible, 
deployment scripts, right? The vendors have their own operational deployment scripts. And so typically when somebody finds an issue with operating OpenStack, nobody else benefits. And that, to me, is a serious problem in an open community. We want our operational improvements to flow throughout the community. So if Red Hat learns how to run OpenStack or Kubernetes better, we want everybody to benefit, right? If uh, a scale operator like Google makes operations better, we want that to come back into the community and benefit, not just by fixing the bug, but operations and how you run the system is as much a part of an operational value as the actual software and fixing bugs in the platform. Okay. And just to make sure you understand the roadmap with this, because uh, Eric Wright was giving a talk earlier today, or yesterday, talking about the Kubernetes sandwich. Um, in this case, we're talking about the bottom, right? I'm not worried about running Kubernetes on OpenStack. We're really talking about how do we make OpenStack run on Kubernetes? How many of you think that that's even a, a good idea? People? Good, about 50-50. Excellent. So I was very skeptical about this, and we, we'll explain it why. Um, I, I'll decompose that a bit, but this is about the underlay. And then one of the things that's really important to me in this discussion, in the whole consideration, is that it must work with Kubernetes primitives. So this is not, right, my ground rules for this whole talk is that we're not talking about using Kubernetes and then hardwiring it so you need an external scheduler to place containers or right, and place services. We're talking about using Kubernetes primitives so that you actually have an operable cluster that you can use for other things and so that the work that we're doing to run OpenStack on top of Kubernetes leverages all of the operational constructs for Kubernetes. Okay? And we'll explain how that works and why that works. Um, but if you're installing Kubernetes and then massaging a whole bunch of stuff in it, that to me is a fail. It's not really using Kubernetes. So I'm gonna take a second and describe Kubernetes. I'm not assuming you, you know Kubernetes that well. Um, it is a container scheduler. We can, we can have a, a, a cage match later about whether it's an orchestrator or a scheduler. It's easier in my mind to think of it as a scheduler. That means it positions containers does some things to keep them up, but for the most part, it's not making a lot of decisions. That would be a platform as a service type thing. Um, and it provides some really robust APIs to restart, place, deal with networking, and life cycle of containers. So you can say, take this container and replace it. Right? Keep, take this container and keep it running. Um, and things that are working with Kubernetes are designed for Kubernetes. It is not magic pixie dust to take your legacy monolithic app and turn it into uh, this wonderful auto-regenerative thing. It's designed to work for something called 12-factor applications, which have a different configuration pattern than, say, OpenStack. Um, it's designed for immutable infrastructure, meaning that you don't patch things in place, you swap them out. Very simple definition of immutable. And it's meant for things that are service-oriented. Uh, OpenStack is a good example of a service-oriented application where we have a lot of different services that have to interact together. Probably could be smaller from a Kubernetes perspective, but it is a good service-oriented app. If you want to see, this is a, a map we built in Cluster Ops that describes Kubernetes. Um, if you're used to OpenStack topologies, this is probably just as scary um, because there's a lot of services. Just like uh, Kubernetes is a cloud-native app, so it is designed with services, but you don't have to worry about a lot of these services. Really, the heart of Kubernetes is very, very, very simple. It has a container runner called Kubelet. It has a centralized coordination point called the API. And then it's back-ended with etcd as a database. There's a lot of other little pieces that plug into that and monitor it, and there's adjacencies that we can worry about, but fundamentally, it's a, it's a service that runs on a node to schedule containers and a centralized database that, you, that tells that scheduler what to do. So uh, the first thing is Kubernetes. So if, if you've been listening to things going on, Kubernetes is rainbows, right? We are, we are now, we've, we've decided OpenStack is old hat. We switched to Kubernetes because it's gonna, we're gonna find this pot of gold at the end of that rainbow. Um, for people who don't know, Kubernetes is uh, named after a steersman or a helmsman for a ship, so you'll see a lot of ship analogies, and the logo is actually a steering wheel for people. Um, it's not. 
uh, going to generate rainbows. It is pretty cool stuff. Um, I'm very excited about what I see in community and, I, and, and the types of abstractions that we get. Um, it does not solve all problems. Um, and some of the problems, so this chart, um, I've been updating as I go and changing these arrows. Some of them started as red. Uh, we've been moving through. Um, the OpenStack problem, operations problem, is not solved, right? That's the first starting point. You, you got to realize, if we thought we already had the, the perfect way to install and operate OpenStack, we wouldn't need this conversation, right? So it's not solved. What I have seen is that the new deployments, not all of them, not all the historic ones, but basically every new deployment I see is using containers as the packaging mechanism. There's a lot of good reasons for that. Containers is really valuable. Um, so we're seeing containers all over the place in OpenStack deployments. Um, Kubernetes is awesome at containers. Anybody who's using more than three containers likely needs a scheduler. There are a couple of them on the market. Um, Docker, Rancher, Kubernetes, Mesos. Uh, there's actually like four or five other ones. Uh, Kubernetes is, is getting a lot of mind share. It's a good community. Um, Kubernetes is, and this is not entirely true, stable, uh, simple, and secure. We are still working on deployment, operations, capabilities, right? Moving OpenStack to run on Kubernetes if Kubernetes isn't actually enterprise ready is not gaining us anything. The velocity of that transition is pretty good. Um, we've been doing a lot of work, my company does a lot of work, uh, helping run uh, an Ansible playbook set called Cargo that we think is really exciting. Um, and that shows HA, enterprise readiness, secure deployment capabilities. So we feel like Kubernetes is good enough to be a, a base for this type of platform. Um, and then the last point here is that if you have Kubernetes, you get upgrades in HA for free. That's not true. If you, your application is designed to work with the Kubernetes patterns, then you will see upgrades and HA fall out of that pretty easily because of the semantics that Kubernetes gives you. But your application has to be ready to take advantage of that, that type of infrastructure. And that is where we'll probably spend a lot of time in this deck. So before I talk about challenges and problems, I want to talk a about some of the benefits. Um, there are very real benefits to this approach, okay? Um, and as a sign, early in, this was one of my last slides before, I think it's actually important to pull it forwards. Because we are talking about a real alternative for OpenStack deployments, right? And so we're already doing all this Docker work, right? Uh, the patterns that you get for upgrading in Kubernetes are real. The challenge is you have to conform to them. So if we conform to what Kubernetes expects from an upgrade pattern, we do get that type of benefit, and we as a community need it. Um, there's a really good job scheduler for maintenance, so when you want to do routine tasks that do housekeeping, you can throw them in as background tasks and it, that's taken care of for you. Um, there is a free fault tolerance where you can say keep this many containers running. It's not as simple in OpenStack because you end up pinned to different pieces of hardware to run your virtualization infrastructure. So you get some benefits in the control plane. Um, this is a big one. If you assume that Kubernetes is going to become a dominant platform, then somebody who wants to run OpenStack could show up and just install OpenStack on top of that Kubernetes deployment. That's my next slide. Um, and then, um, the other thing that's a benefit to a lot, of, a lot of people in thinking about this is it's very constrained. So if and when, I would say when, the OpenStack community embraces Kubernetes as a deployment, as the deployment, dominant deployment uh, choice, it's going to drive a lot of uh, decisions because it's a more constrained environment. So you're not gonna have all the options that we, we have enjoyed as a community. That's good, there's pros and cons for that. Um, but fundamentally, what we want, what the community, in, in my opinion, needs very desperately is reduced friction for these deployments. Um, and that's really one of the things that we want to look at. We want to make it much easier to deploy and maintain an OpenStack infrastructure. Um, and we want to be able to do it inside of a growing community. Um, one of the benefits of Kubernetes that's important to understand is that Kubernetes is a cloud infrastructure. So it has very low friction to deploy and install. If you want to run Kubernetes, you need an Amazon account, and you can have it running in about five minutes. That is not true with OpenStack. OpenStack, 
I mean, we have DevStack, but that's not a running infrastructure. That's, that's development tooling. Uh, you need servers. You need to network them together. You need to do drives and all sorts of stuff. Um, and it takes time, even if you're doing a managed service. Right? It takes time to get an OpenStack infrastructure running. So um, this is coming. Uh, I, have, I have, you know, I was on the skeptic side. Uh, you can go back and watch my earlier talks. I, was, I, was, I really thought that this was a bad idea initially. Um, but it's coming. And I think that it's very important for us to be pragmatic. There's been some great talks. Uh, AT&T did a talk earlier today. Um, I've seen a whole bunch of other things going on about this Helm chart uh, approach that, that we're going to outline about how to actually get this to happen. So I see a lot happening in the community. Uh, since, even since these slides, I've been watching people do the very similar work um, as I'm going to describe in, in multiple projects. So we're actually seeing some, some forking and competition in, in that approach. Not my favorite thing to see, but that, that's what happens in open communities. All right, so before I talk tech, this marketing message is confusing, right? It, is, it is, would be irresponsible to not say, hey, wait a second, OpenStack on Kubernetes, I, what I, the thing that the market hears from that is Kubernetes. Um, and that's true. Um, one of the challenges with this is that as we describe this type of, of positioning, the clear message that people get is that OpenStack is not as big Kubernetes is much bigger, um, and that's the reality, I think, of the message. It also um, hurts, and, and I think uh, the, the foundation has really moved, changed away from this. I missed the keynotes this morning, so maybe they, they're gonna, they proved me wrong this morning. But they've, they've been moving away from this OpenStack one platform message. If you think back to Barcelona or Austin, the message for OpenStack was one platform, containers, metal, and VMs. Um, if you're putting Kubernetes under, it's, it's not as clear that that's the message. So OpenStack has to evolve. It has to respond to these challenges. There is no doubt that Kubernetes in this model is a challenge to where people have perceived OpenStack to be uh, in the past. Um, that's the way the technology goes. Um, and I think there's also some confusion between container uh, operations and what this is. So this is very much about a Kubernetes deployment. Containerizing your OpenStack deployment, it's a great idea. A lot of people are doing it, but it is not the same as what we're talking about. The purpose of this talk is to lay out Kubernetes as a management plane, manage, manager to control those containers. You, there's a lot of ways, I've seen tons of them, very creative, to use uh, Ansible and, and Chef and Juju and things like that to place containers on servers and then manage the containers. Different, it's a different strategy, right? Because you still have to manage those containers using something. In this model, you don't. You use Kubernetes to manage it. I've been beating on that point, but I think it's really important. One, this slide just repeats that, so I'm not really gonna go over that, except uh, to point out that the idea here is that we need to be thinking of ways that OpenStack adopts Kubernetes principles. Right, so 12-factor application. You need to be able to handle containers being added and removed. Um, there's, there are operational requirements for Kubernetes um, that OpenStack is going to have to respond to as this process gains momentum. Okay. And those are things like uh, containers changing IP addresses and going away off the infrastructure. Um, it's the idea that you're, they're immutable and you can't configure them, so you have to have ways to get configuration into containers that's important. Um, so there's a lot of aspects of creating a Kubernetes microservices application that were not factored into the OpenStack designs. OpenStack designs assumed service persistence. And Kubernetes applications do not assume service persistence, if that makes sense. I'm not seeing tons of people nodding, but I'm not going to spend more time. We'll get into Q&A, and, &A and uh, if that's confusing, I'll, we'll explain it. So I have, I have a much bigger pi uh, architecture picture, um, but I want to have a little bit of text to prep this. So Kubernetes is now at version 1.6. Uh, the 1.5 release brought in some critical primitives 
that we needed to make this work go. So before the last two releases, um, we really couldn't have done uh, OpenStack on Kubernetes. Um, and the, the, one of the key elements for this, this whole process is something called Helm. Helm is heat. This is, this is a horrible analogy, but it, it's workable. Helm is heat for Kubernetes. So you can create a Helm chart. It's a, it's a YAML file that describes how an application is positioned and how it interacts with other applications. So it's sort of a, you know, VM, it's like you would take heat and spin up multiple VMs. You can take a Helm chart and spin up multiple containers and wire them together and describe uh, requirements. If you're used to Docker, Docker has something called Compose. Helm and Compose are, are very similar things. Helm is not Kubernetes. Helm is an add-on into Kubernetes. Kubernetes has worked really hard to keep a very th small core, and so uh, the community resists adding a project like Helm into the core. They, they keep things like that in the ecosystem. So you will probably see alternatives to Helm surface, and that's normal. Um, but the efforts that we're seeing do use Helm. It's the dominant um, container scheduling infrastructure. Um, right. uh, okay. Um, so that's important. There's something called tagging. So what, what you can do with, with Kubernetes is you can say this node has these attributes, and then when you go spin up a Helm chart, you can say put the Helm chart on nodes that have these capabilities. So you could make them uh, compute nodes or control nodes or Ceph nodes or things like that. And so you can actually have an affinity within the infrastructure based on tagging. Um, that becomes an important component in this, and so it's part of building a cluster for OpenStack is to tag things correctly. There's a technology called daemon set um, that's very important for this type of work. So in Kubernetes, normally you want to just run containers and let Kubernetes schedule them. You do not want them to be privileged containers. Um, in, in, there is an option to create a daemon where you can run a container as a privileged container. So if you, without that capability, you couldn't run Neutron and allow it to have access to the network, right? Or Swift and have, allow it to have access to the drives. You're gonna have the containers operating in a more isolated mode. Um, and that's important because it's part of the, the, the protocols that allow Kubernetes to do an OpenStack deployment, which doesn't act like a normal, <laughs> doesn't act like a normal Kubernetes app because you're gonna have long-running processes, long-running containers. Uh, databases require you to have stateful sets. So a stateful set is a 1.5, it used to be called pet sets. Um, some people are happy about that change and some people aren't. Stateful sets mean that there is a shared storage or a persistent storage for a container. So if you have a container that must maintain state, or in the pets versus cattle analogy, must be a pet, you can uh, have that container keep its state. So a database is a really good example of a stateful set application. And for us to do databases in this model, uh, which we're doing, you need to have stateful sets. And then those have to be backed by a persistent storage. So what we actually end up with is Ceph uh, for that. I'll show that in the next slide. Um, and then one of the things that was really important for the AT&T crew, and I think this is, is very useful, is there's multiple sources for the containers that include OpenStack. So in everything we're describing, we're talking about container scheduling. The containers have to come from somewhere. So somewhere, somebody is building OpenStack containers that have the OpenStack Python code in it and are packaged according to the semantics of the Helm charts. And so that, somewhere that has to be done. And if you want to run this on ARM, somebody has to build them for ARM. And somebody, right, so we have an interesting place where if you want containers from a trusted source, then you're gonna need to be able to have a source for the containers. So containers don't magically show up like mushrooms. They actually have to be built and maintained, right? So if somebody patches OpenStack, then somebody has to create a new container before you can then roll that container out into your infrastructure. So that's the primitives. Hopefully that helps translate some of what we're talking about into Kubernetes speak. Um, if you need more Kubernetes lexicon, we can talk about that. I'm happy to, happy to help with that. Um, and there's a lot of things that we really have to do that aren't solved problems yet. I'm gonna flip to the next slide, and we'll, we'll talk about this. So this is an exploded version of that architecture, and it's designed to show you a lot more details about how these things work together. So 
Um, Kubernetes is a platform that has its own control infrastructure. Um, so there's a control set of control nodes. If you're running in production, you're going to have three of them at least. You might separate out uh, etcd and all sorts of things. Helm is an application that's going to run on those controllers. It's not extra nodes. This is not meant to be a node mapping, by the way. It's, it's a logical mapping. You have a set of Kubernetes workers. The Kubernetes workers are going to be what, where OpenStack actually runs. So the idea here is that I could have a, open a Kubernetes cluster and run the OpenStack control plane in that cluster as, as a general capability, and Kubernetes would schedule it and keep the database up, keep the message bus up. All of the OpenStack uh, management components would be running. Because I need stateful sets, I need Ceph installed first and wired into the stateful set. So I can then use Ceph as that stateful set back end. Um, that was something I thought would be a lot harder. Um, this came in actually pretty quickly. I, I don't think it's a production grade Ceph cluster yet. Um, to do that, you actually need physical. It's a, that's a longer story. I will take that as a question after, afterwards if people are interested. Um, but there are, there are challenges like how do I create a production grade scaled Ceph in a Kubernetes cluster? It's a great application for Kubernetes, and there's a lot of people who are interested in running uh, Kubernetes to maintain the Ceph infrastructure also. That's a, not an OpenStack problem, it's a Ceph problem. But it's really interesting. And the same thing is true with software-defined networking layers. So we need to be able to run software-defined networking in a way that attaches into the infrastructure correctly. Kubernetes has its own software-defined networking stack. And by default, containers are going to go through that stack. So if you're running Neutron with Kubernetes, we now have a, a, a conflict between how Neutron wants to interact with an SDN layer and Kubernetes wants to interact with an SDN layer. And that will be a challenge. In some cases, you could use something like Romana, um, which is a flat networking technology in Kubernetes, and then just let Neutron do its thing. It could be that we actually want to bind to another NIC. There's a lot of ways to solve this problem. Uh, some of them are going to be more elegant than others, but definitely workable problems, but they're not solved yet. So when you look at this chart, right, I'll go back one, right, we have to be able to handle networking, we have to be able to handle storage, we have to be able to deal with the fact that OpenStack expects to have configuration in a way that is different than what uh, Kubernetes expects to have, con have configuration come from. Kubernetes really doesn't do that well if you drop a lot of files, because files are persistent objects, files into your configuration space. Right? We don't want to be mapping a file on a hard disk into a container to make it run for Kubernetes. We can, but that then drives a whole bunch of bad behaviors in Kubernetes. So there's challenges that we have to resolve in doing this. Now, if somebody came up, uh, my company's been playing with this. We have some demos. I have a video. I, I can't do a live demo for this, but um, I have a video that shows doing a one-click, lay down Kubernetes, lay down OpenStack on top of it. Um, this is, is, is achievable. I think that within, with a couple months of work, especially with the progress and interest, that we'll actually see this being a very practical deployment. But you, you're not, Kubernetes doesn't have any knowledge of the infrastructure. So to make this work, we're going to have to poke infrastructure information into this Kubernetes deployment and then have that drive the Helm charts, which then drives the deployments. So there's, there's work that we need to do to make all this stuff go. Um, you know, I'll, I'll do the gratuitous plug for what Rackin does. We do an open source project called Digital Rebar that collects a whole bunch of infrastructure information and then can inject it into installs. So, right, it's possible to do that. If, if without something like what we do, you're going to be taking Ansible, um, play, Ansible roles or handcrafting Helm charts to have that infrastructure information in it, right? And, and this, this is one of the places where uh, Kubernetes is a stretch for OpenStack, right? Kubernetes' job is to make you not care about infrastructure. It really hides a lot of the infrastructure information that you would want to do a good OpenStack deployment. If you're, if you're building a Ceph, you want to know where the SSDs are because you're going to need to put your, your caches on SSD. You're going to want a JBot array, and you're going to want the drives enumerated to build that Ceph cluster. Right? Makes perfect sense. None of those things are going to show up in Kubernetes. It doesn't have any infrastructure information. So you're going to have to add it into the Helm charts or add it into the configuration when you bring up 
that Ceph cluster. And then you're going to have to know which nodes that Ceph cluster is coming up on so it has the correct drive information. And then, that's right, I told you there's work to do. And then we want to do this in a way that's generic because it's not helpful for the community if you can spin this up in your lab or in your facility and you've handcrafted Helm charts and somebody turns around and makes an improvement and you're forked. So part of the goal for this, a huge part of the, the motivation for doing it is that if you're using this approach, we want to be able to have everybody benefit from improvements within the community, right? We're actually moving into a place where the Kubernetes platform allows us to start sharing operational lessons and improving together as a community. If we start forking it to make this stuff happen, we've reduced the benefit for that, right? I don't want to see us have, you know, operational uh, chaos version two where everybody's doing Kubernetes on OpenStack, but we're all doing it differently. Right. We really want to be able to find ways to bring that, that work back in. Um, uh, as a parenthetical aside, if even in the Kubernetes community, we're struggling with this, uh, just like OpenStack struggled with it. Um, there were, there's a list of over 60 different ways to install Kubernetes. Um, it's not really quite that bad, but there's a significant number of people who have picked up different ways to do it. Um, my company's working very hard to not follow that pattern, and that's why we use the Cargo uh, Ansible playbook straight out of community, right? We do not want to have any custom Kubernetes deployments at all. We don't want to have any custom OpenStack deployments, right? There's a, from our perspective, a distro is an anti-pattern uh, for the core, core aspects of this technology, right? Everybody we talk to wants to stay in upstream for something like a deployment or the core bits, and so we're working very hard to do that. And I think it's important here. And I have one more point. Ah, yeah, so configuration. So the, the idea here is um, immutable infrastructure. How many people are familiar with the term immutable infrastructure? Awesome. Wow, the, this, this is on a great curve. Um, so the idea here is that part of, part of the challenge with this, part of something that I think is going to have to come back upstream for OpenStack is dealing with immutable infrastructure from a configuration point. So we need to make OpenStack configuration not rely on configuration files that have to be injected into the infrastructure. It needs to, we need to be able to spin up a service, have it pull in its configuration. And I believe Keystone uh, v3 has some of those capabilities and we could leverage that. But this approach, as it gains momentum, will put stress on that effort. And I just spent a whole bunch of time talking about this, so I'm not going to try and reread the slide. Um, right? What I do want to emphasize is the point with this is to try and get OpenStack into a more operational point. Right? I, we, we have to look at, look at what's been going on. We have not been converging operational practices into a single set of playbooks or roles or um, technologies, right? We continue to have different camps of deployers. Um, this is potentially an N plus one problem, but what I've been seeing in the field, in my conversations and in the hallways here, is that there's a significant number of people who are moving their deployment patterns and plans into a Kubernetes Helm chart approach. Which means I'm very optimistic that we're going to see a convergence in the community where people are actually working on this approach and making this go. Okay. Um, the other thing that makes me excited is uh, seeing Kubernetes on metal, um, which I think is, is a logical conclusion of where people are going to go. Um, this approach does not work if you, don't, if you think Kubernetes will not run on metal, right? Kubernetes is the base. It's going to be the thing running on metal. All right, I've talked through all these other points, so I'm going to do it. I'll upload these slides to uh, SlideShare. I'm Zeekel online, so I'll tweet out this, and if you see me on, you'll, you'll see it. Cool. Uh, so operability is not solved by this aspect alone, right? We can't just rub Kubernetes all over OpenStack as much as we're trying to right now and have it solve our operability problems. Operability is not just deployment. It is logging and monitoring and all these other important pieces. Um, we have to provide leadership. Technical leadership has to be motivated to solve these problems. OpenStack is going to have to prioritize work 
that makes this easier to do, and that's going to disrupt other plans. Or people who want this to happen are going to have to show up in the community and fight for it, same as, same as always. Um, I think we have to resolve or accept the, mes the messaging confusion um, because there's no doubt that this messaging will, will push uh, Kubernetes off or OpenStack off its pedestal to an extent. Um, if you're listening to the sessions and keynotes and not already thinking that OpenStack is being pushed off the pedestal, then um, listen more carefully. I, I think we're already in a, in a position where OpenStack isn't, isn't the data center operating system at this point, right? We are part of an infrastructure uh, in the data center. I don't think anybody gets to claim the data center operating system, Mesos be damned. Um, and so um, I think there's collaboration. I think Kubernetes ultimately will have a larger footprint. Um, this was really controversial when I said it six months ago. Um, and I'll, I want to support it now even so. Kubernetes runs in Amazon, Google, on OpenStack, in Azure, on Metal, on Raspberry Pis. It is showing up everywhere with very little friction, which means that developers are going to target this platform and use this platform, and it's going to actually have a bigger footprint than people who are going to run and deploy OpenStack. You already can see that. And so it is very important, if you take nothing else away from this, it should be the, oh shit, I better be figuring out Kubernetes or some other container scheduling system because that is going to be the first thing that I use as an abstraction layer. And then OpenStack is going to have other benefits around that for helping me with VMs and things like that. But this is, this is a, it's, it's a bigger, Kubernetes is going to be a bigger thing. And my prediction that I'll leave you with is in 2018, so next year, next time we're, we're talking about OpenStack installs in, in the North American uh, continent, I predict that Kubernetes will be the install method that people are using. And I have, I have data, I can't share all my data, but um, I have good reason to believe that's true. Cool, thank you, appreciate it. I have, I really don't have any time for any questions, do I? Is there any one question fast? I'll take them at the front of the room then. Oh, I do have one, thank you. So the question is, why, why can't you use config files with Kubernetes? The problem is, is that you don't know anything about the actual running instance of that container beforehand. So you can't inject configuration information about what, what's like, where it's gonna, what IP address is, or its name, or how much memory it's gonna have, or it's maybe, maybe memory it's gonna have, but all of those things are actually done dynamically by Kubernetes when that container is started. And it has to be done dynamically because Kubernetes could turn off that container, move it to another machine, change its IP address, right? change the name of, you know, change all sorts of aspects of what that system's doing. So if you expect to configure that container, you are making a decision that you know what that container is gonna do, and that you don't. And so you, you really have to give up the idea that you know ahead of time what's gonna happen with that container. Now, OpenStack requires us to do that, so we pin containers to machines, and, and we can fudge it, but it's fudging it. It's, it's really hurting, it's, it's actually hurting the long-term capabilities of how this stuff would work. So I hope that, that helps. It's a great question. It's hard to get your head around. And one more. Actually, uh, there is a very elegant uh, solution for that problem with the Kubernetes environment. You use the init container, so before your main process starts, init container runs it before, then you can grab uh, from the config map, which is mount to your pod, whatever configuration information you need, and uh, just apply to the process. Because when the init container starts, you can get your name, host where you run, IP address, pretty much anything. It's av available. You push down to your main process. Your main process comes up with the configuration it needs. So, uh, configuration issue is not the issue with the Kubernetes. 
It, it, that, to me, that's a workaround, but I agree with no, you. There's, no, there's it, ways. it was designed that way. Okay. Good. So this is, an, you know, one of the things I love about giving this talk is we're consistently finding places where, you know, either I didn't know something that we could do or we're finding people are solving these problems much faster. So um, this has been a really exciting, fast-moving project, and we're going to continue to see progress and evolution which reinforces my point. Thank you. Appreciate the time.